Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, and welcome to my session on, on uh, Kubernetes risk assessment. I uh, appreciate it. I know that you come after lunch, so it's uh, definitely appreciated. Um, and just a quick poll before we start. How many of you are assessing risk in Kubernetes? Great. How many of you heard about the CIS benchmark? Nice. Okay, perfect. So we're in the right place. I'm not going to talk a little bit about it, but it's not the main scope of the talk. Um, great. So my name is Ariel. Uh, I'm today part of Cisco, uh, part of the responsible for the security application, uh, cloud security application in Cisco, uh, in, in, in a business called ETNI, which is a new business unit on emerging technologies. I was uh, in PortShift, which was acquired by Cisco. I was in Aqua Security. Some of the people know uh, this company, even in Checkpoint before that. Working on some open source contributions, uh, whether it's um, uh, QB, it's a nice open source for creating S vulnerability scanning, uh, part of the CNCF in a few initiatives, and also MitreTech. Anybody familiar with the MitreTech? Great. Okay. So we're going to talk a lot about it. Um, great. So Kubernetes risk assessment, you know, why do we need it? Where does it come to play in our life? And how many, you know, uh, you know how many times you're doing it in a year? So just as a, for those of you who are in, involved with it, how, how many are you doing it periodically, those risk assessment for clusters? You know, CIS benchmark, compliance, anything? Okay. I assume you don't do it for fun. You're doing it because, you know, you're trying to assess. Now, the challenges that, you know, that at least force us to go deeper into this risk assessment is, you know, ideally is understanding where we are, you know, what are the risks we have, what do you think we need to mitigate. The primary suspect is, of course, the application, you know, pause, the worker knows because this is where the attack usually happen. But, you know, the master node and the control objects are not less important, maybe even more, because a small change in the master node or a small change in the overall is going to create a much bigger impact, right? So small changes on any of those elements can create, you know, big impact. And this is why you always want to monitor them more. Even more than that, you know, the Kubernetes clusters are have dynamic parts, we keep changing, we're changing objects, we're changing roles, we're adding policies, we don't have policies. All those changes, you know, you make like a you know, small change in role-based access control without understanding who has this role binding, and you end yourself, you know, open up uh, yourself to many potential attacks. Same thing, apply for policies, you enable something, you change AP, and then all of a sudden all your cluster uh, is exposed, and there's objects like ingress and egress, that make it even harder. Now, usually, you know, I, I love this picture because I always find myself like, you know, in a constant, you know, chase that usually, you know, we need, we have compliance, usually done once a year. A lot of times it's required that with threat modeling because, you know, we want to come to developers and tell them, you know, how they need to design and plan their services so we want to better understand what is the threat. And most commonly, uh, usually we want to avoid the abuse of the cluster a lot of crypto mining, you probably read a lot about it, it happens, and we want to make sure that uh, we covered and we're not exposed. So I ask you about the CIS benchmark. Um, so the CIS benchmark is definitely a great start. Those who are familiar and working with it, you know, it's, it's very impressive. Um, there's a really, you know, very comprehensive set of security checks, you know, focusing on securing the configuration of Kubernetes elements, so it starts, you know, I think the CIS benchmark was the first that was there. It was the first framework that people start using. It was like very in the very beginning of Kubernetes. And the good thing is that they keep updating it, you know, as things are moving by and they keep changing for every version. Uh, there is a new uh, CIS benchmark. And indeed, it's, it's a very, you know, compressive check. I'm going to see it in a minute really touches everything on Kubernetes, you know, everything on the master node, uh, ev even a lot of comprehensive checks on the worker nodes and admission controllers. And warning, this is, you know, tough pictures, but it's really, really, really like, you know, a detailed list of many, many, many tests that you need to check. Now, again, as I said, you know, they keep updating it, updating it, which is very good because, you know, they are keep uh, doing yeah, a, a great job in that. Again, most of, you know, I think, you know, most of the attacks are 
uh, usually because of those misconfigurations. Now they also go into like network policy, ensuring that you are setting up some policies, covering even the you know, role-based access control, secrets, making sure that any sensitive information using secrets, and I even saw that in the recent editions, they added stuff about port security standards, which is fairly new, uh, recommendation for isolation using SecComp, which is very new. And, and again, they're doing a great job in making sure you configure your cluster uh, carefully. So this is really great. Now, I think this is the primary you know, topic of my talk, is that CIS Benchmark is a really great start, uh, but it's definitely not where you need to stop or it is definitely not, not enough. Why it's not enough? Because those benchmarks provide, you know, looking at all the security misconfiguration. Now, security misconfiguration are indeed the primary cause for cyber attacks. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But security misconfigurations are not the only risk factor in clusters, right? When you look at all the attacks which are published or all the nodes which are made, most of them coming from different vectors. A lot of them coming from backdoors in like open source images. Like I read a lot about, you know, new images which were discovered and new backdoors which were added into it. A lot of them coming from compromise on insecure but very popular tools. And those who remember last year, there was a big campaign on Kubeflow, uh, people using Kubeflow for machine learning in Kubernetes clusters. And there was a very nice campaign in Azure that really exploited some misconfig, I mean, not even like, you know, deliberately, but some, you know, uh, mistakes that were made on the configuration of Kubeflow, uh, network manipulation. There was a recent uh, CVE which was sh showing how you can uh, leverage the ingress if using Nginx in order to expose secrets for the clusters. So the idea is that misconfigurations are important. Uh, definitely it's, it's a good place where to start but definitely not where you need to end if you want to make sure that you are, you're, that you are secure and make sure no one is abusing you. You need to take pay attention into the actual, I would say, dynamic content. You know, images, uh, networking, things which usually are being exploited uh, when you want to launch an attack. Now, if you ask yourself, okay, so we understand that misconfigurations is a good start. We understand, you know, where, you know, we want you know, where we can start, but the question is where we want to go, or how do we make it, you know, even better? And here, I think there are three factors that we need to consider when we plan our ideal risk assessment plan. I think the first one is the attack context. One of the challenges that I personally find the CIS benchmark is the fact that not all misconfigurations or not all vulnerabilities are born equal, right? None of them are equal, some are more important, some are less important, okay? Uh, some has bigger success or bigger impact, some are smaller, what I, smaller impact, and we need to factor in what is the real risk. Now today when you look at the CIS benchmark, usually you run this test, you get to see, you know, how much you accomplish, where you are covered, where you're not, how much you need to, to add more. There's no details on what is the impact of this misconfiguration. This is like some untouched element that you never reach to it and it's good it's going to be configured properly but it's not such a big thing if it's not or it's something that you know open your cluster for any anyone to go in like a dashboard or something like that it is very powerful and there is no uh, login requirement to do it you really need to add some more risk context into those tests this is i think an important uh, aspect to consider another thing is the security context so ideally you know, or sometimes you can find yourself that with changing one setting or changing one security layer, you can eliminate many risks. So there is also, you know, balance between how much effort do you need or what you required versus how, what the gain that you gain. So again, one of the challenges that I see in the CIS that there is just plain list of tests. You can see where you're complying, where you're not. And what you need to complete, but you don't see like if you can do one change, then maybe it eliminates all the other changes. So there is, there is need to be like more holistic view, something that gives you, you know, uh, the, the, the full context of the security. So it'd be much easier for you to plan and to configure your security tools in the right way. And the last item, which I think is critical, 
is the remediation context. So good risk assessment tool should lead to good remediation plan, right? And if you can do everything with automation, it's the key. So for one side, run an automated process to assess all the risk and then run an automated process to mitigate those risks and, and, and mitigate them. And I think those, in my opinion, of course, would be great uh, tools to take our risk assessment one step further. Okay, so let's try to examine what other options are there on the table if you know we want to indeed to go uh, one step further in our assessment. So this is the Mitre Tech. I don't know. I hope, hope people are familiar with it. Um, and the Mitre Tech publish and the Mitre Org to be more precise publish an attack matrix for different environments. When they see that there is an environment that is becoming popular for attacks, uh, they publish an attack matrix, which is actually you know, a very detailed list that lists all the techniques and the tactics and the techniques that were used in the wild. So they not doing just theoretical tests or theoretical uh, explanation of what can be done wrong, but what are things that which are really being used. So sometimes, you know, there are great theoretical risks, but the exploitation is so hard that it's almost impossible to use them. So the, the, the beauty about this matrix is you're taking a list and they're doing a lot of work to validate them. They, those are were actually in use and the specific environment that the matrix is, is trying to cover. Uh, and what I like very much on those matrix, matrixes is that they are organized according to the cyber attack kill chain. So you really get the security context. So you see they, all the stages of the attack, you can see where are the, you know, the exposure or where are the items based on the attack, and then you can understand, you know, to yourself, you know, where you are and what you need to do maybe better, or, you know, could be that there is a risk, but it's like maybe down on the chain that if you cover everything before, maybe it's not relevant for you. So I think that this cyber context and cyber kill chain is very important. So happily, uh, the Mitre Tech uh, published a matrix on containers. Uh, it started in 2021, after almost a year of research and validation. Uh, and it really documented all the real-life attacks on containerized environment. Uh, it was a very good cross-country collaboration, and I'm happy to say that you know, we in Cisco collaborated a lot into this uh, work. And, and, and the beauty about it that you know, until then, when you look about you know, research on containers attacks and stuff like that, you can find a lot of theoretical things. On every KubeCon, you can see many talks about how you can break out and what you can do. But in the real life, most of them didn't happen. Now, most of them maybe because they are too complex, that they because I would say attackers are lazy. Probably you don't want to assume that. But one of the things that the, the, the Mike could put you know, as a start, starting point, which was very, very important for them is, we really want to know real things, real things that happen, real attacks, not just uh, theoretical ones. And I think this was, for me at least, the first time was a very uh, interesting initiative that looking at you know, things that are, are real and give you something that more better validation to what you think. And, the, and at the end, reached like plus 40 attack techniques, which each of them is really documented. So, for every technique, there is detailed information on what is the method, how was it actually really used, you know, when and where it was discovered, how you can mitigate it, you know, how you can detect it. So sometimes, you know, you want to detect before you mitigate it. And you have like very good references. So if you really want to read uh, and get, you know, more information about it. So overall, I think it was uh, a very interesting initiative. Uh, we can look at it in this table. And as I said before, all, the, all those you know, tactics that are listed here, every cell in this matrix contain like a real life attack, attack that happened uh, in real life. And the beauty about it is that it's really set according to the attack kill chain. So you can see on the left, this is the initial access. You know, how do you access a cluster? How do you access a, a, a container? Uh, so you can see like, for example, you know, exploit public facing application. There's references to all those dashboards which were exposed, whether the Kubernetes or Kubeflow dashboards uh, which were exposed. How do you do external remote services? How can you abuse them in order to get access to your clusters? Uh, and then there is, there is the technique for the execution. You know, how do you execute you know, your code uh, on those clusters? 
uh, persistency, how do you maintain persistency, privilege escalation, and again, a lot of detailed, uh, detailed techniques, good information, a lot of things which you can do, uh, at least if you want to assess the risk of your cluster, those are items that you definitely want to check to, making, to make sure that you're not exposed. And as I said, when you can see the context of what part of the attack, what stage of the attack it's happening, you know, for example, that if you are covered and there is no way to do initial access or execution or persistency and you really covered your privilege escalation in a way that no one can make it, then if so, maybe if you have you know, wrong things in discovery, you can understand that your risk is not so big because until an attacker needs to reach a discovery phase, you need to pass so many things which you covered and you protect, then you understand that it might be an issue, but not you know, a big one. On the other side, if you see that, for example, you have holes here you know, in the public facing in what you know, document as initial access so it can lead to an execution, then maybe a bigger impact because all the rest will follow. So I think overall this context um, is really important when you want to assess what is the actual risk of your cluster. Let's take you know, a deep dive into just like examine uh, and, and examples. So one example is, you know, execution. You can see like, you know, for example, mal malicious image. This is just one of the sales. So you can read all the information about how this can be abused. You can see who abusing it. For example, Team TNT. Uh, it's a known uh, attack uh, group uh, that is using it in order to get, you know, usage, I think. Uh, in this case, was mainly for crypto mining. You can get the details on how you mitigate it, how you detect it, and overall, it's it's a good way for you to test, you know, how to avoid it uh, in your clusters. You can even see who are the contributors of it, uh, which is again very nice information. Uh, same thing about container API. How can you abuse them? And you know, I choose those examples because not just to show that it's it's really working, but mainly because. Those are items which you cannot cover by CIS benchmark. So CIS benchmark, which is a very good start on how you configure things properly, but if you don't look inside you know, the active components, you will not be able to discover it. Those are items which you're not, you're not going to define. And I think that this is you know, an area where the MITRE attack can really provide, uh, provide you know, a good benefit and a good usage for the user. So, what are the benefits of the attack metrics? So obviously, you know, it enlarges the coverage of techniques which goes beyond security misconfiguration. You know, you get to see the real attack context. So users can understand the impact and the risk and plan their mitigation in accordance and provide a good remediation context, how to mitigate it, how to, you know, minimize the exposure, what do you need to do? But there are also some challenges. Okay, uh, not, nothing is perfect. Uh, there are some challenges. Uh, and here, one of the challenges, for example, in the MITRE tech is there is lack of automation. The good thing about the CIS, you can really automate the process, the many tools, you know, you can really automate it, you know, get it from cloud services, they can, you know, do it for you. Um, and here, you really need to do it, a lot of things you need to do manually. You need to manually go and check, you need to manually, uh, you know, do it. And the lack of automation, you know, this is something that, of course, make it uh, much more error prone, take it a much longer process, uh, and put some burden on the on the user. Now, another challenge that I think I, I, I see in the uh, in the attack matrix is it's a reactive approach. So it's only docu it's only document and listing attacks which took place. But unfortunately, you know, in the cyberspace, also in, in Kubernetes, we talk about very creative, you know. Uh, attackers, uh, and usually, you know, it's, it's good to know what happened, but you also need to predict what will happen, right? And, you know, we don't look, if you only look at, at what took place, you know, it doesn't mean that we're going to prevent new things that will change or something new that uh, can happen uh, to our cluster. So I think that the MitreTech is provide really in-depth approach, a very good look at it, but still is not perfect. Okay, so that leaves us to the question of what's needed, right? If you really, you know, want to create our ideal work, is what do we need? So here, 
I have more, I would say, wishes than just uh, really concrete work uh, that I can share. But I'm saying we definitely want to add an element which is, I think, missing in all the different uh, framework, which is the security context. Today, every item is being looked independently. There's no overall security context. So the desired security context can allow users to check the impact of each mitigation. So if I do one mitigation and I cover many, many risks, of course, the cost benefit for me is much bigger than if I do a lot of work and just cover one risk. So assessing what, uh, what is like, you know, the protection context uh, versus, you know, the, the risk can, can help me to prioritize on where I, where I can get the bigger value, of course, right? So having this overall context, because sometimes, for example, let's assume that I see many risks coming from potential, you know, network exposure. So I'll put just, you know, create policies on my ingress or my egress, right? Or if I put maybe uh, more, I will protect my network, create like maybe more restrictive network policies on whatever coming into my cluster, I can really save many of those risks, right? So this is like an idea where if I have a broader context and a mitigation plan which take this context into consideration, I can optimize my steps and I can get, you know, uh, better uh, value to my efforts. Another thing that is really missing is the proactive approach, right? The most challenging barrier is assessing the unknown. And I think, you know, it's always hard to predict the unknown, right? It's one in security, this is one of the big things. You never know what you never know. But here, this, this, is an, where, this is an area where the CIS is doing a good job because, yes, you don't know everything that you can do, but if you know that you can minimize the attack surface by covering all the different elements and, you know, adding um, this security layer. And as I said, automation is definitely key, especially in, in Kubernetes environments. And this is a call to the open source community that's here in the room, is to create automation tool for the Mitre attack metric, something that can assess the test and can also help you to automate the remediation of it. So if I ask myself, you know, what would an ideal Kubernetes risk assessment framework would look like? So I think, and again, I'm, I'm saying it's ideal because there's a lot of work uh, around it, but something that starts with leveraging all the CIS benchmark which prevent, you know, the common and maybe the unknown risk by setting up, you know, good security posture to the environment. Something that leverage the Mitre attack matrix because it check where in the cluster you have exposure to exploitation that took place in the wild. So you can really know that this is something that can really happen to you. Uh, we did it, you know, uh, in Cisco. This is something that we also contributed back, you know, to the Mitre attack and, again, hope to create some more automation around it. Uh, and of course, something which is fully automated, uh, and not just in the ins inspection, but also in the remediation plan. And hopefully it's not done annually, once a year, when the security team comes and asks you to do compliance, but something which you do uh, constantly to making sure that uh, your clusters are always uh, protected and not in the risk. So if I want to summarize everything, Kubernetes clusters really require, you know, content risk assessment. It's not something you can do once in a life and go to, you know, to do other things. It's a constant work. You always need to check yourself because, unfortunately, uh, the good things which happen, but also sometimes bad things happen. Um, the common framework is the CIS benchmark. I think it's a very good and comprehensive work, really comprehensive set of configuring tools, can be automated, really, really great start. Um, but again, it's not enough because it's only focusing on misconfiguration. And this is where I presented the Mitre attack, which is a very good, you know, uh, uh, it's a very good work that's really looking in the details and provide you, you know, what I said, you know, the risk context, you know, of where are you in the kill chain of the attacks, you can really provide good detection and mitigation options. So you can always, you know, know how to detect or how to mitigate uh, these attacks. But again, even together, we still need more steps to get to the ideal framework because we also need to look at not just showing me risk and show me what's going to go wrong, but also showing me how to fix it. And where is my bigger value in fixing and what, are, what steps I can do, for example, in fixing like an infrastructure layer and then automatically eliminate 
risks that coming from the application because the infrastructure itself is secure or the cluster is protected or there is no way to do exploitation uh, by you know uh, providing a more uh, basic layer. That's it. Thank you very much. I hope it was interesting. And I hope you find it useful and you're going to protect your clusters. Thank you. If no more questions, then I give you back a few minutes.